and I'm glad you're here. I'm always glad to see you, but I'm glad to see you today because I believe God wants to do something special in your life today, today, today. Through this sermon, I don't know how it's going to play out this sermon, but I really believe this sermon is for you and it's for this church today. You're at Redemption Church, and we believe in the power of the Holy Spirit. That's the kind of church you came into today. We believe in the power of the Holy Spirit. We don't believe we should just go through a few songs, clap our hands, and go, all right, that was a good little musical performance. No, we believe that the power of the Holy Spirit can show up while you're singing, that people can be healed, that people can be delivered, that people can receive more of God in just a few moments than they ever thought. And we're not here just to give you a simple sermon that you go, oh, that was some good information. No, we believe that it comes straight from the Word of God and it's empowered by the Holy Spirit to break chains off your life, to set you free, to bring you peace, to bring you hope. And when we open this altar at the end of this sermon, we don't just open it up so you can just say a really simple, now I lay me down to sleep, good God, let's eat kind of prayer. No, we believe that when you talk to God, We believe that the Holy Spirit can show up and can bring power to all the life situations you're so worried about. It can happen in this altar. You're in a church that believes in the power of the Holy Spirit. That's the kind of church you're in today. We believe that God's Spirit is alive and present. Have you ever experienced the Holy Spirit. Real quick, I know we just look around. Tell somebody about a quick experience with the Holy Spirit. Make it quick. Look around. T- turn to somebody. Tell them. You can get up out of your seats. It's okay. It's totally like that. Tell somebody a spirit uh, experience you had. Real quick. We'll make time for it. Whatever. Your experience with the Holy Spirit is, do you believe that greater is in front of you? I mean, you could have just told the most amazing story, and those Holy Spirit stories are amazing. I overheard Marshall's story. Marshall has a wonderful testimony about a cell phone where he totally heard God speak to him, and it's amazing. I love, you, you never stop telling that story, buddy. I love it. But even these amazing, supernatural, powerful stories. Some of you told stories where you were healed. Some of you told stories where you didn't know how you were going to pay the bills, but God made a way out of no way. Whatever your story is, whatever your experience, do you believe that there is a greater experience coming? Because if you don't, that's not faith. And if there isn't a greater experience coming, then God isn't all that impressive as we make him out to be. Can we just say it? Whatever demonstration of the Holy Spirit you have witnessed, do you believe that a greater demonstration is coming? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, not to me. I'm just normal on me. No, no, no. You need to believe it for you. No, oh, I'll believe it for you, Pastor. I believe it for, for the missionary. I be- no, no, no. You need to believe it for you, Jeff. You need to believe it for you, little Rob. You need to believe it for you. You got to believe it. And whatever you felt in God's presence, you have those stories where you felt God's presence. While we were worshiping it, that was our prayer that you would feel God's presence. Whatever presence you felt, do you believe that there is a greater presence coming? That you'll feel more of God than you've ever felt? Do you believe that's in front of you? Whatever miracles have you seen, do you believe that greater miracles are coming? Do you believe that? Hopefully you believe in miracles, but do you believe that greater miracles are coming? Do you believe a greater outpouring of the Holy Spirit is coming? That's really what I want to talk to you about today. A greater outpouring of the Holy Spirit. I want to tell you that Christianity remembers the past. The Bible is full of the past. It's mainly the past with some prophecy for the future. But it is mainly the past. Christianity remembers the past. We study the past. The past is important. But we always look forward 
to the future. We always look forward. We, we aren't living in a museum. We aren't living in a bygone era. We aren't talking about, oh man, those were the good days when Jesus was walking around on the earth. No, as Christians, as people that really believe the word of God, we believe that greater things are coming. We believe them. We believe that God's going to do greater things in our heart. We believe that always the best is to come with Jesus Christ. When Jesus Christ shows up to the party, they run out of wine. He makes better wine. He does things that nobody else can do. He always makes them better. When it comes to the Holy Spirit, your Bible says that a greater encounter with the Holy Spirit is coming. Now, in order to believe this, number one, you have to you have to believe that you have not had the greatest experience ever, that actually there is a better experience than you. And it's really shocking that Christians have trouble with that sometimes. They're like, oh, no, no, I've got the mountaintop experience. I don't need to go any further in Jesus. If you're willing to go further, you can go all the way to heaven further. It's amazing, the amazing, powerful things that God can do if you're just willing to walk and if you actually believe that, that he has greater for you. Now, not everybody believes all this stuff we're talking about with the Holy Spirit. There's, there's Christians, there's even denominations out there that, are, that would really be uncomfortable with what I'm talking about. Maybe you're watching this right now. Please hear me out on what we're going to say because we've got some real scripture to share with you. There are some in Christianity that believe the outpouring we read about in the book of Acts ended with the last apostle. When he breathed his last, that was when that outpouring stopped. They believe that that book of Acts ended and there's no more Acts of the apostles. Uh, there were some good, uh, they believe that there were some good days then and that there are some good days ahead of us and by good days they mean heaven. They don't think that there are actually good days here on earth for the church. They might not believe that there are good days where Jesus Christ heals people just like he walked around Jerusalem and healed people. They don't believe that Jesus could speak to you in a moment and give you wisdom and give you understanding and give, give you prophecy, give you something powerful. They don't believe that still happens and they, they're living in the past. They believe when they talk about the great days that are coming, they don't have, hold much hope for this world at all. All hope is in heaven. And guess what? That's a great hope. But I'm here to tell you today that there is hope for this earth, that the gospel is to be preached, and amazing things are supposed to happen, and there is going to be a greater outpouring of the Holy Spirit than the world has ever seen. And I need you to believe it. Redemption Church, I need you to believe that. You want to stop the move of God? You want to stop what God wants to do in this church and in this city and in this world? Let's just not believe that he's got greater for us. That'll stop it real quick. I believe there's greater. It sends me to an altar every service because I believe there's greater. It makes me excited every time I'm going to preach to you, not because I think I've got my act together or I know everything about the Bible, Leon. No, because I believe he's got greater for me, and there's no telling what's going to happen. There are good days for the church of Jesus Christ right now. Right now. Not just in heaven, but right here. In Redemption Church, I need you to believe that. We're going to be study, studying prophecy today, and I'm going to keep it really bare bones simple with you, okay? You're going to learn a few things, all right? It won't be too painful, okay? Okay, Jeff, you with me? All right, good. There, there is prophecy that declares a greater outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Before we look at, uh, at that prophecy particularly, uh, we need to understand what the Bible says about harvest. Look at somebody and say harvest. Harvest. We're going to talk about the harvest. This is context, and all this is going to uh, flow off this context right here. The Bible frequently uses farming language, mainly because the, the major occupation in that day and when it, which it was written was farmers. But also, God has created everything to show us this gospel truth, even farming, even seeds. Everything in life points to Jesus. It's amazing. All right. Jesus tells us that we reap what we so what is that? The sowing and reaping? Sowing is your planting and reaping is your harvesting. That's farming language, isn't it, Buck? You get that? That's farming language. Uh, Jesus speaks about the parable of the seed, of the parable of the sower. And so the sower is he's sowing seed. And the seed is the, and who knows? It's the word of of God. And the word of God is looking for good soil so that the seed can grow up into faith. That's good. 
There are more parables about the workers in the field and workers in the vineyard. There's several parables about the master. He hires workers to go out and work in the farm fields. There's, there's parables about barns. The, there's so many parables. It's like over and over. The Bible has some weird hang up with farming. No, there's a spiritual principle about harvest that we need to catch. I want us to get it. Paul describes the ministry of the gospel this way, 1 Corinthians 3 and 6. I planted, Apollos watered, but God made it grow. Does that sound like farming language? Paul speaks to Christians about the fruit of the Spirit. As saved people, as followers of Christ, as people with God's Holy Spirit living inside us, we should bear fruit. We should be like a plant that bears fruit fruit, all right? On and on. There's so many examples. None of this is exhaustive because we don't have enough time to be exhausted. The second coming of Jesus Christ. Anybody know about the second coming of Jesus Christ? The, it's, also, it's called the catching away of the church. It's also known in some circles as the rapture, all right? Even though that word's not technically in the Bible. The word rapture is likened to collecting and reaping a harvest. So when you talk about the catching away of the church, when that trumpet sounds, whoop, we're up there to see Jesus face to face. When you picture that, God pictures that as a harvesting. He pictures that as, oh, this is some good fruit. I'm going to take it with me. 1 Thessalonians 4.17 talks about that catching away. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together to be uh, with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Jesus uses harvesting of the wheat and tares to teach us about the rapture and the coming judgment. All right, wheat, we know what wheat is. That's some good stuff right there. But do we know what tares are? Tares are weeds. They're bad. And if, man, you want to see some weeds, I've got, I've got an excellent example over at the flower beds at my house. We can come look at them. All you want. Weeds don't take any effort to grow at all, do they? This, this rain that's come that, man, I don't know about the St. Augustine grass in my yard. That It's not affected, but the weeds sure are. It's crazy. Jesus, he talks about wheat and weeds in Matthew 13 and 30. Here's what he says. Let both grow together until the harvest. Let wheat and tares grow together. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned. Then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. The wheat and the tares will both be harvested. They will both be plucked up. There is an eternity for everybody, whether they believe in Jesus Christ or not. There's going to be a harvesting moment where all the seed of the earth, all Abraham's seed, all of Adam's seed, every seed of the earth is going to be harvested. All right? Wheat and tears. Wheat, where do they find themselves? They find themselves to the Father's storehouse. The Bible talks a lot about God's storehouse. And the tears, where do they end up? They end up being burnt up in a fire. What does that represent? It represents hell. It represents eternity away from God's house. We are either wheat or we are tares. There is nothing in between. We are either deciding to, to be a seed to receive the seed in good soil, or we're deciding to receive another seed, the seed of a weed in, in our soil. We either weed or tares, but either way, we are going to spend eternity somewhere, heaven or hell. Now, we're talking about harvest. We're talking about seed taking root in the soil and growing up into maturity and producing fruit. That's what it means to be a Christian. The symbolism mirrors the lives of Christians who receive the seed, which is the word of God, within their hearts, and they grow up into spiritual maturity and show forth the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 5, 22 and 23 gives you the list of fruit of the Spirit. Now, uh, let's look at a prophecy. Okay, we covered harvest. Now I want to look at a prophecy about supernatural harvest. Can you look at somebody and say supernatural 
harvest. We just talked a lot about a natural harvest where you have natural seed and you have ground and you water and then that's a lot of natural stuff. But God uses all of this to speak to the supernatural. A harvest that is greater than anything previously experienced is what is coming and it is a supernatural harvest. Amos chapter 9 verse 13. Look at the scripture with me. The days are coming. That's really important in prophecy, those words. Look for these days to come. These days are coming, declares the Lord, when the reaper will be overtaken by the plowman and the planter by the one treading grapes. Amos 9 is about the restoration, the restoration of Israel. All right, the context, because it's important to look at the context, guys. The context is bringing them back from destruction and exile. They were far away in another kingdom, but God has brought them back. And in the midst of bringing them back, he gives them this promise in Amos 9, 13. And while they have been brought back from a physical exile, they are now physically back in their home, in their nation, in their city, and in their homes. They're back. That's physical Their true, full, and complete restoration comes when they allow Jesus Christ to be their king. Let me tell you, Israel is back from exile physically, but not spiritually. And that is what God, that's what's going to wrap this whole thing up, everybody. Them coming back to full restoration. All these scriptures about the prophecy, about them being restored, it hasn't fully come until they receive Jesus Christ as their king. I'm looking forward to that day. And if you need restoration for your life, that's the key for restoration in your life as well. All right, full, complete restoration coming through Jesus Christ. Now, Israel's full restoration is no different than the restoration you've received in Christ. I think that's important. Uh, Having repented, having been baptized, having received the Holy Spirit, having received exactly what happened in Acts chapter 2, having received the Great Commission, all of those things... The, the, the nation of Israel is going to receive that and be fully restored. You have already received that. So you ought to be just crazy excited. You ought to be crazy excited about that. Thank you, Jesus, for fully restoring us. Although we can interpret Amos 9 in a natural sense. We can totally interpret that in a natural sense. That, that God's going to do these natural things and you'll come back to uh, this physical location. Israel comes back to their land... And is blessed with success. All that happens in the physical. There is also a supernatural interpretation. In fact, I would have you look at Amos 9.13 and tell me any other way other than a supernatural one does that scripture get fulfilled. We'll talk about that in a second. And that is what we see in Amos 9.13. I declare that the prophecy in Amos 9.13 can only be fulfilled in a supernatural end time revival that is bigger than anything we have ever seen. Can we throw that scripture one more up there? One more time up there. Amos 9, 13. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when the reaper will be overtaken by the plowman and the planter by the ones treading grapes. There is coming a day when the reaper, the reaper is the one who collects the harvest. He brings the harvest in. He cuts down the wheat. He brings in the grapes. He plucks the, uh, the corn. He, he, he's the reaper. He is going to be overtaken by the plowman. This isn't normal. This is not how normal physical harvests work. No, you don't overtake me. I'm working here. We got to fix all this stuff up and then we'll end this season and plowman, then you get to work. You just hold off. Your job's not done yet because we have this physical law of harvest in seasons, right? The, the, but right here, I want you to get this, that the reaper cannot collect the harvest quickly enough for the plowman. Now in the natural, the plowman, he's already done. He's plowed and now there's a harvest there and he's waiting for the next season. No, not when a supernatural harvest comes. He's already needing to go again because there is something supernatural. There is something powerful. Reaper, you can't go quick enough. I've got to get this field ready for the next thing God has for us. 
You see, the plowman already needs to prepare the soil for the next harvest. And we're talking quick. We're talking soon. We're not talking let's wait a few months or a year. Some harvests take a year. Some harvests take months. No, we're talking we got to do this now. That's what's happening in Amos 9, 13. It's like they overlap. That doesn't happen in fields. If a plowman, plowman's running over the reaper, that's not good for the reaper. It's not good for the harvest. But in a supernatural manifestation, in a supernatural harvest, God can do anything he wants. And it'll overlap. And at the same time, you can reap. And at the same time, you can plow. And at the same time, you can see progress. And at the same time, you can plant. It's amazing what, what God can do in the supernatural. Likewise, the planter is overtaken by the treader. The treader is the one who takes the grapes and he smashes them in the vat and he creates wine. That's what the treader is. The planter in this verse can't work quick enough. He's being overtaken by the treader. He can't work quick enough. The treader already needs a fresh crop. The treader's like, I need more grapes in here. I need more grapes in here. What's happening here is supernatural. And it, it's beyond the natural. This is supernatural harvest. Natural harvests work in seasons. They work in order. Plowman, you wait your turn. Planter's turn. All right? Treader, you wait your turn. It's, it's the reaper's turn. All, all these things. Natural harvest works within a season, and each season yields one harvest. That's how it works. One season, one harvest. But here, in God's supernatural harvest that is prophesied to come, there is more harvest than a single season can contain. God has a revival coming. God has supernatural blessing that it's more than one season can contain. And you already need to start plowing while you're reaping. You already need to start planting while you're treading because there's that much abundance that God has in the supernatural harvest. This is a supernatural harvest. I believe that there is an end time revival coming that we cannot contain. I believe that God wants to do something on the earth that we can't contain ourselves. It's going to blow our minds. Before Jesus returns, there's going to be a supernatural harvest. Can I tell you? A supernatural harvest that no church can contain. No church can contain it. Redemption Church... We can't contain it. We don't have enough chairs for the revival that God wants to bring. We don't have enough chairs. We don't have enough preachers. We don't have enough people to baptize. There is a revival coming, a supernatural harvest coming that's bigger than any one church. It's bigger than any one church. Oh, but we need to build a bigger church. Maybe we build a big mega church building. Let me tell you, it doesn't matter how many big mega church buildings you have. It can't contain the revival that God has because it's supernatural. Don't look to a natural building to contain a supernatural harvest. It's going to be way bigger than that. It's going to be way bigger. God's storehouse is bigger than any denomination. Guess what? Denominations aren't big enough. They aren't big enough. That you cannot, when this supernatural harvest comes, we can't stand around and say, well, bless God, I'm Baptist and all that matters. No, because harvest is everywhere and God's going to be saying, get to work. Save the day. Night is coming. Receive the harvest. Not only that, can I speak to some people right here? We're a non-denominational church, but I want to speak to some Baptists. Baptists, we love you. You better get ready for this harvest to come. Methodists, get ready for this harvest to come. Lutherans, get ready for this harvest to come. You get right in the middle of the supernatural of the Holy Spirit because God wants to use you because our stupid denominational lines are not big enough to contain everything God has for us. Yes. Like the book of Acts, it will spill over from upper rooms and into the streets. It will spill out from Solomon's porch and into the rest of the temple. It goes and it starts in, in an area, but it ends up going further. It goes from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to somebody finish the words. 
the ends of the earth, the uttermost parts of the earth, this supernatural harvest is not just some field. His harvest is the entire world. His harvest is the entire world. You don't know somebody that's not a part of the supernatural harvest. You don't know somebody that God is not trying to cultivate the fruit of the Spirit in them. You've not met the person that God's not trying to grow His Spirit inside of them. Do you believe greater is coming? Do you believe greater is coming? Let me tell you, Christianity, I am sick of Christians that don't believe greater is coming. I've had it with you. You need to wake up. Greater is coming. Greater is on its way. It's not yet come, the words of Amos 9.13, but it says the days are coming. I want to briefly pause on Amos 9.13. 9 and 13. Will you let me for a second? Because I've got something else to tell you about. It's prophetic imagery of the latter and former rain. Look at somebody say latter and former rain. Latter and former rain. The Bible in several areas, several places in the Old Testament talks about latter and former rain. I've got it in my notes. You can look it up on the website if you're looking for those, that information. God often uses the natural to display his supernatural plan. The cross was a natural thing, but man, it, has, it contains a supernatural plan. And the seed and all of his parables, every parable Jesus gave was the natural. He always spoke about the natural. His, par- his parables contain natural characters like father, prodigal son, good Samaritan, a farmer, a widow. His parables contain natural objects like a lost coin, a lamp needing oil, like a seed. But Jesus used these natural pictures to display spiritual truth and spiritual promise. All right? You get that? Here's something that happens in Deuteronomy way back in the Old Testament. I mean, you have, Buck, in order to find this, you have to go way to the left. In fact, you need a new Bible because you only have Psalms and Proverbs, right? Of the Old Testament. Yeah, you have to go way to the left there. Deuteronomy. Look at this verse right here. 11 and 14. Deuteronomy 11 14. Then I will send rain on your land in its seasons, both autumn and spring rains. Everybody said autumn, autumn. and spring rains. So that you may gather in your grain new wine and oil. God sets up a covenant right here with them that I'm going to provide two kinds of rains. One of them is called autumn rain. One of them is called spring rain. The other things they're called are latter and former rains. All right? You get this picture? The latter and former rains are natural events in the Middle East. They still take place today. You bet they still take place today because God would be a liar if they did not. The farming calendar was marked by two very necessary rains. Rain is necessary for farmers. You better believe it. The former rain was also called the early or autumn rain. This rain would soften the soil. It would establish the planted seed, causing it to germinate and sprout forth. I love to see a new plant sprout forward. That's always interesting to see, all right? The rain was necessary for harvest. If they don't have this rain, they don't have the soil prepared. They don't have the seed germinating. Times of famine were caused by a lack of rain. Anytime in your Bible there was a famine, it was because of a lack of rain. Rain And Deuteronomy eleven thirteen 13 actually talks about when you're obeying me, I give you this rain. So th- you can check that out. That's, that's really interesting. Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Okay, so uh, that is the former rain, the autumn rain. God promised to come to us like the rain. He, he, Hosea 6, 3. Look at this. Let us acknowledge the Lord. Let us press on to acknowledge him. Come on right there. You, you acknowledge the Lord. Not just acknowledge the Lord. Sometimes you got to press on to acknowledge the Lord. We get on to you sometimes about worship. You're like, I'm doing it. I'm worshiping. No, we're going to press you a little bit to acknowledge the Lord. That was free, all right. As surely as the sun rises, he will appear. He will come to us like the winter rains, like the spring rains that water the earth. He is talking about the latter and the former Rains, the former and the latter rains right there. God is going to come to us just like that. Who is going to come to us? 
God. So this is deeper than we're just talking about rain here. You see that? This is God himself is going to come. His prophecy, his, his covenant with us, and something he's going to do supernatural is going to come through these rains. God, God does stuff with rain. All right? God promised to pour his spirit out like rain, Joel 2 and 28. And afterward, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Now, there might be some that would say, well, Chris, how do, what, what, I mean, how do you know that that's the Holy Spirit? Well, Peter thought it was the Holy Spirit, and that's good enough for me. Peter tells us that this scripture that Joel prophesied in Joel 2 is fulfilled in Acts chapter 2 with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Read it yourself, Acts 2, 17. He quotes Joel. He says, in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. That scripture is fulfilled with what? The outpouring of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit is going to come, be poured out like rain. It's going to fall from heaven to earth the outpouring of the holy spirit that we read about in the book of acts is the former rain it's that rain that came early it softened the hearts and allowed the seed of the word to be established the holy spirit outpouring established and empowered the church there would be no harvest without this rain there would be no church without this rain the church of jesus christ was born in acts chapter 2 when the holy spirit came the church is still sustained and empowered by the same holy spirit it's the former rain but what about the latter rain the former rain is the autumn rain, the, the winter rain. It's the early rain. What about the latter rain? What is that? The latter rain is also called the spring rain, and it occurs close to harvest. When it's harvest time, man, there are a lot of farmers going out. Man, I hope that latter rain shows up because this harvest isn't ready. We aren't going to have much food on the table except this latter rain shows up. But God promised it would show up. So we're going to trust him. This rain, when it showed up, it causes the crops to be ready for the harvest. The harvest is not ready without the latter rain. It causes the fruit to pop open. Where there wasn't fruit before, now there's fruit after the latter rain. In fact, wheat crops became strong crops, abundant crops after the latter rain. Rain fell. Now, all this is in the natural, but it speaks to the supernatural. This is important. This is what I want you to focus on. Underline my words in your head. The latter rain was twice the downpour of the former rain. God uses the natural to display the supernatural. The former rain was so big. The latter rain was twice the downpour, all right? God uses this natural occurrence to display the supernatural harvest. There is a latter rain of the Holy Spirit that will get his church ready for harvest. And what's harvest? It's Jesus' return. That's the harvest. There is a latter rain coming that gets the church ready for harvest. It's going to get the entire world ready for harvest. In fact, he can't come until they are ready for harvest. Yes. And the latter rain has to come because he promised it would. It will cause the fruit of the Spirit to pop open in everyone's life. You're going to see some people, you, they're going to receive this rain of the Holy Spirit and their lives are going to be completely changed. You've met some people like that. We've got some people in this church just like that. When they got the Holy Spirit, everything changed. They actually became pleasant to be around. Scott. Thank you, Jesus. You're pleasant to be around ever since that. All right. It will strengthen and enlarge the harvest. You ever feel like the church just limps along? You look at the church world today, it feels like we're just limping along sometimes. It's like the church world doesn't even get it. The church world doesn't know what to do. The church world focuses on stupid things. The church world is lame most of the time. Oh, you know what it needs? That crop needs 
a latter rain. That crop needs a latter rain. And when that latter rain comes, it's going to transform the world. It's not just going to change Redemption Church. It's going to change Plano, Texas. It's not just going to change your family. It's going to change your neighborhood. It's not just going to change your ministry. It's going to change the world. God uses this natural occurrence of the latter and the former rain to show us what he wants to do in the supernatural. The harvest is the return of Jesus Christ, but before he comes, a latter rain will be pulled, will be poured on the earth. How big is the latter rain going to be? Twice as big. It's going to be twice as big as the former rain. What was the former rain? Acts. The entire book of Acts. Everything that was happening in the book of Acts. All the, and the, how they turn the world upside down. Okay, get this. It's going to be twice as big as that former rain. God will do twice as much as we read about in the book of Acts. God will do twice as much what the miracles we read. God's going to reach and impact twice as much. The manifestation of God's power is going to be twice as much. It is going to surpass the book of Acts. It is going to surpass Acts chapter 2. It's going to surpass reaching the entire area of Samaria. It's going to surpass going to Macedonia. It's going to surpass going to Rome. It's going to surpass all of those things. Because God is trying to show us that with the latter and former rain. So here's something you need to know. Church, get ready. Get ready. Jesus is coming, but before he comes... You better, don't just be ready for Jesus. Be ready for the reign of the Holy Spirit to come because greater is coming. I want you to say it loud with me. Greater is coming. Can I tell you, you haven't seen your best church service yet. Some of you have this picture in your head of 30 years ago saying, oh man, that was a good church service. Then, uh-uh, no, your best church service is in front of you. You haven't seen your biggest miracle yet. You're going to see bigger miracles. You haven't felt the greatest presence of God you're going to feel. You haven't seen nothing yet. The latter rain is coming. A supernatural harvest is coming. Now, I'm going to be coming to a close very quickly. I have two very short points to make. I want you to stay with me. First is this. Supernatural harvest can come from unexpected places. You think you got it figured out, but no, you don't. We're going to look back at harvest, at at Amos chapter 9, verse 13. Harvest from unexpected places. Look at this last part of this verse. Amos chapter 9, verse 13. I want you to read it with me. New wine will drip from the mountains and flow from all the hills. Now, wine is symbolic of... The Holy Spirit. God uses the natural to point us towards the supernatural. Wine is symbolic of the Holy Spirit. Wine is going to drip. Wine is going to pour. Wine is going to flow. From where? From mountains. From all hills. Now where do you build vineyards? Is it called Napa Mountain? Is it called Napa Hill? No, it's called... Napa Valley. It's also called Napa Flats. It's got to be in a flat area. It would be very unexpected for it to come from a mountain. Anyone would tell you, you would be crazy to attempt to build a vineyard on a mountain. They would tell you that is dumb. That is a bad investment. I want no part of that. You're not going to have anything but frustration and you're going to lose all your work and all your money and all your effort. It'll never grow on a mountain. It'll never grow on a hill. But when God gives a supernatural harvest, wine drips, wine flows, wine pours from unexpected places. You know some people you never expect to see at church. You say, no, that person, they're never going to come to Jesus. No, that person is nasty. No, that person has too much baggage in their life. They could never find Jesus. Oh, but when a supernatural harvest comes, 
Oh, wine pours from unexpected places. There are going to be people that sit beside you in this church you never thought were going to be here. And I know we're people of faith. And we tout ourselves, oh, yeah, I've got faith. I'm going to tell you, you don't have faith big enough for what God's going to do. God's going to supersede your little mustard seed faith. You're going to see miracles. You're going to see signs. You're going to see wonders. There are people that have a disease, that have a sickness. But when a supernatural harvest comes, guess what? God puts his anointing on you. And out of nowhere, you lay your hands on them. And the Bible says you pray the prayer of faith. And people are saved. People are set free. People are healed. Greater is coming. Do you want that? Supernatural harvest is coming. And it will flow in unexpected places. It will flow in you. It'll flow in you in places you've never expected it to flow. Some of you can never sense you talking or ministering in front of people. But let me tell you, when a supernatural harvest comes, you have no idea what it's going to do in your life. Some of you, you, you think your family is doomed to always be this way. But a supernatural harvest, it can change some things. It can change some things. Some of you think Redemption Church is always going to look the way it looks. But I'm telling you, a supernatural harvest is coming. And it's bigger than anything you've ever seen. And it's going to change people's lives. And it's not because we're good. It's not because we got our act together. It's because he's promised before he comes back, he's going to give us the latter rain. He said he himself will come like the latter rain. Wine is going to pour from unexpected places. That is what a supernatural harvest is is and it will happen so fast you can't keep up that's my second point first one it's going to pour from unexpected places but it's going to happen so quick you can't keep up the reaper will be overtaken by the plowman while he is yet reaping the harvest another is already preparing the soil for the next seed That's what the plowman does. He's going to overtake. And and the planter is going to be overtaken by the speed of the treader. We can't work quick enough. And and the the seed goes into the ground. I want you to get this picture that the seed goes into the ground. And it usually takes so long for that to germinate. It usually takes that rain to come. But no, it it usually takes that whole season for it to grow. But in a supernatural harvest, you're going to see some God miracles happen really quick. You're going to see some people that are so far away from God, and it would take years for them to grow into ministers. It would take years for them to grow into Jesus, but God's going to do it miraculously. That seed is going to hit the ground, and supernatural harvest is going to come. Somebody's going to be going, hey, get out of the way. i got to reap this. The seed goes into the ground, and supernaturally, it becomes a grape. That's what God wants to do. That's what he wants to do in your life. Let me tell you, let me, let me set you straight. You don't have to go through 20 years of, of seminary. You don't have to go through a seminary degree. You don't have, you, whatever you want, want to be used of God, no, it can happen right now. It can happen so much quicker than you ever thought. You just be open to the rain. You be open to the Holy Spirit. Peter goes from a cursing fisherman, but after the Holy Spirit comes on him, just like Jesus said, he got power to become a witness. And the next thing you know, he is standing before potentates. He's standing before magistrates. He's standing before Pharisees. He's standing before the smartest people, and he's putting them on their ear. What happened? It was Jesus. It was the Holy Spirit. It was a supernatural harvest, and it worked really quickly. But in the days coming, it's going to happen twice as fast. It's going to happen so fast we can't keep up. So this is this final point right here. We're going to be opening these altars for a time of prayer. I want you to please come to these altars today. God wants to pour out some latter rain in your life. You come to these altars today. Please come for prayer in this altar today. God wants to do something in your life. A supernatural harvest requires workers. There's more to this sentence, but I want to stop there. A supernatural harvest requires workers. It's not enough to just say, hey, we want this. No, we need workers. We need people that will be working in his kingdom. But here's the other thing you need. 
We need workers that are open to the supernatural. You don't get a supernatural harvest if you don't want a supernatural harvest. You don't get a Holy Spirit outpouring if you're afraid of the Holy Spirit. You don't get a Holy Spirit outpouring if you say it's dead and gone at the end of the apostle's life. You don't get that outpouring. But if you will want it, if you'll be open to it, if you'll stop being afraid of what God might do, you can work in it. Any church in America can have this outpouring in it. Any church in America can have it, but you can't be afraid of it. Let me, let me go a little further. There are gifts of the Spirit that scare some people. They scare people. They don't understand it. Oh, you need to be open to it. There's tongues and interpretation. And I know that's really weird stuff, but it's apostolic. It is in the Bible. It's supernatural harvest. You don't be afraid of that. You desire that. Stop being afraid of that stuff. Desire that stuff. Redemption Church, don't be afraid of worship where you get lost in the Spirit. Don't be afraid of coming to the altar desire it we can't have the supernatural harvest if we're afraid of the supernatural are you with me does that make sense does that make sense I need some people that aren't afraid of it I need some people that aren't afraid of somebody laying hands on them and praying for them I need some people that aren't afraid to get in a baptismal tank and get baptized. I need some people that aren't afraid of being infilled with the Holy Spirit. I need some people that aren't afraid of letting their emotions go and cry before the Lord and weep and let God take them to a place of supernatural intercessory prayer. Some of this stuff is news to you. You don't even know about it. The question isn't, do you know about it? The question is, do you want it. If you want it, you can have it. If you want it, we can talk to you about it. You can receive it. Today, it can happen quicker than you ever thought. Matthew 9, 37, Jesus said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Matthew 10 and 1, this is the very next verse. He called his 12 disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out evil spirits and heal every disease and sickness. Look at the coming harvest, Jesus says. It's plentiful. Now let me, let me cue in here. He's not talking about a grape vineyard. He's not standing next to a harvest of, pe- a harvest of, of corn here. He's talking about people. He's talking about what's going to happen in Acts chapter 2 when when Peter preaches the gospel. He's talking about what what Paul is going to do when he goes and he shakes off a poisonous snake and everybody's amazed and he preaches the gospel. That's what he's talking about here. The harvest is plentiful. The harvest is here. It's not coming. It's here. We need workers. Redemption Church needs some workers. It's not all on the pastor. It's not all on the youth minister. It's not all on staff. It's not all on the volunteers. It's on all of us. And I want you to get this. I want you to go to verse 38 one more time. Matthew 9, 38. Get this. This is the one prayer request Jesus had. Look in your Bible. I I can't find any other prayer request that Jesus ever had. Here's one. He wants them to pray, ask the Lord of the harvest. In other versions, it says this, pray ye the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. You want to know what's so close to Jesus' heart? You want to know what's close to Jesus' heart? This right here. You want to have Jesus active and alive and opening up doors for us? Be a church that does this right here. Be a church that preaches Jesus. Be a church that talks to people. Be a church that that feeds homeless. Be a church that goes out into the field. Doesn't stay cooped up in the church building, but goes out into the field. And then Jesus does what? He gives his followers the authority to do the supernatural. God wants to give you the authority to do the supernatural. God wants to give you power to lay hands on the sick and they recover. God wants to give you power 
to look somebody in the eye and tell them about Jesus. God wants to give you a courage to lead somebody to repentance. God wants you to baptize somebody one day. God wants you to open up the word of God and show it to someone. God wants to do that. He's going to give you authority to do that. Do you want it? We need reapers. We need plowmen. We need planters. We need treaders. Let me bring it to you this way. Buck, while you're bringing one of your friends to know Jesus, and they're in the midst of coming to know Jesus, it's going to happen so quickly that your other friend is going to come. And while you're trying to get him saved and get him to know Jesus, your other friend is going to come. And your sister is going to ask about it. And somebody else is going to ask about it. It's going to happen that quick. Marshall, you're going to ask one guy at work and he's going to come. But before he, before he could even come, someone else comes. That's how it's going to happen. There's going to be people show up. They're going to show up. They're going to show up. And it's going to happen so quick. There is a revival. You know when the day of Pentecost came in Acts chapter 2, 3,000 souls were added to the church that day. 3,000 souls were added to the church in a month-long revival. In a single day. How many sermons were preached? Supernatural. Supernatural harvest. It's coming, Redemption Church. It's coming, Redemption Church. Could you worship like you believe that it's coming? Could you receive the word like you believe it's coming? Could you start inviting your friends? Could you start praying like you believe it's coming? Could you come to this altar Right now, this altar is open. Could you come to this altar like you believe it is here? We need workers that understand the season and are not afraid of the Holy Spirit. Workers that will embrace the Holy Spirit. We're going to talk to God in this house. If you want special prayer, you come in the first two feet. We absolutely love you. We want God to do great things in your heart. I want us to be a church that calls on the Lord today. In the name of Jesus, Lord, we love you. We want your harvest, God. We want the seed of the word of God in this house. We want the seed.